wonderful thing. And for all the young people, let me share something with you right quick. Um, the world tells us this tis the season to be jolly. Oh, we're tilted. Because everybody's jolly, right? At Christmas time, and, and everybody gives gifts to each other, and it's, it's just what we do, and it's just a great time. And I'm glad that the world gets to enjoy Christmas that way. But for a Christian, we have a reason to be joyful. God became flesh and dwelt among men. The Christ child was born. The Lamb of God that takes away sin of the world. Why would we want to give gifts? Because we were given a great gift in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing this song. Seventh of January, we had them here maybe 18 months ago. I don't remember. It's been they've been here. It's a good presentation, good uh, good time. So they'll be here in January. Um, it's really good. Uh, you know, they they're loud, fun, and it's great because they drown out all the Baptists that can't clap on rhythm. So it keeps it loud and keeps it moving. So you know, we're good for the first couple of beats, and then we get it going. So uh, that's a good time, and certainly family. And I think I assume that's open to the community. So share that with others. Um, Johnny, do you want to share a little bit about something you're kind of looking at doing? Yeah, uh, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. His name is Tim Hawkins. He's a Christian comedian. Uh, heard, heard him quite a bit on a few social media apps and whatnot. But uh, he's coming in April. 
to Birchman Baptist, I believe, in Fort Worth. And I was looking to see if anyone in the congregation or any church family members want to get together and go down and, and just have a fun evening. It's on Friday, I believe it's April 19th. And uh, take a van down there, go on, drive down, whatever, just meet up with church you know, families and have a good night out. Just good, clean, Christian communion, fun. It uh, makes a lot of, you know, flaws in Christians, like, not flaws, but like, you know, the, the, you know, what Christians do, like, as far as, like, worship and praise, and they'll just take it off, and, you know, different styles of worship, like, you got your window washers, you got your TV carriers, and just, you know, he, he, he just takes it, goes with it, has fun time with it, so, uh, but it's a April 19th, I believe it's Birchman Baptist in Fort Worth, if anyone if wants to go, just get with me, I'm going to look at ordering some tickets pretty soon. I believe they're roughly around the $89 a ticket range, which might be a little steep for some, but but, uh, but I'd, I'd like to get a group together and go down there just to have a good time. So just get with me this week, and we'll see if we can get some tickets over. Um, and I know I'm always teased about singing a solo. You know, this before kind of cut out at times, microphone difficulties. You know, I think the window is hit today. I feel like God's leading me, and I'm a little nervous. I know Hillary's going to sing a special here in a minute, so I'm not going to take away from her. I'll need your help on this, but Mrs. Jane Alexander celebrated her birthday, her 28th birthday. So, if you need to sing happy birthday to her, I think that would be great. All right. opportunity for you to uh, help some people locally. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a ministry that I recently found out about. It's called uh, the Angel Tree Fellowship, uh, Prison Fellowship. And this is nationwide, but this is a way that you can help people in your backyard. Uh, kids that, whose parents are incarcerated, and there's many just here in Cook County, Denton County, and uh, this year, I've, I requested to uh, help out a few families here in the Cook County. They're in Gainesville. And if this is something you're interested in, uh, come see me afterwards, and I'll, I'll talk to you about what kind of guidelines there are for buying the gifts for them and how we can get it to them before Christmas. So one more way to uh, bless a family whose parents are incarcerated. So um, last week, we lit the candle of hope. And this year, uh, this week, we're going to light the candle of peace. And I've asked the Moon family to come up and do that. Would y'all come up this time? We both had to make sure we had our readers with us. Yep. It is that time. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 9-6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So I was going to read the second one, and she said, hey, you're supposed to just read the scripture, uh, but um, most of y'all who have known me, if I get in front of somebody, I'm going to talk a little bit about some leadership. And uh, so he had given us these three scriptures in this morning, but... Before that, he's like, if you have something, you can use what you have. So I went and did a little bit of research, and uh, it just so happened that I came up with one of the same scriptures he did, which uh, it has to be a God thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. And I think about this as a leadership opportunity because I think when we think about our problems, it's usually a problem of leadership. And, you know, you have to be a leader of one before you can be a leader of many. 
and uh, finding that peace is part of that. But I went back up a little bit into 1423 to add one to it, if it's okay. And I think with the opportunity of peace comes a responsibility as well. And in 1423, he replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. And so I saw that as we get that opportunity for peace, we also have a responsibility as well. And uh, that's leading yourselves so that you're able to lead other people in your life. And the last verse was Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing some carols. Stand, please. Yes. 
job. I can hear you guys. All right, let's ask God's blessing on the offering today. Love incarnate, love divine, star and angels gave the sign. Bow to babe on bended knee, the Savior.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hillary. That was beautiful. Uh, piano, Rick, Tony, it was all awesome. Thank you, Chris. You'll give them a round, a round of applause. Isaac, thank you back there. You're the man. <laughs> uh, we're going to dismiss uh, Children's Church at this time. Follow Miss Valerie. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me. I want to compare two verses, the majority of it, of the message. One is Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verse 34. Put a finger on that one and then, and then flip over to John 14, 27. So we'll continue to expand on what uh, Jason told us earlier. <laughs> and we'll look at that responsibility that that peace brings. There's many different views of peace and, and what it means. Uh, when you hear the word peace, what do you think of? Maybe a peace sign, right? Um. Maybe it's world peace or, or countries that are in a period of, of peace and war. Maybe you think of an officer keeping the peace. Or, um, you know, uh, Wyatt Earp's six-shooter revolver, the peacemaker. How many of y'all know about that one? Yeah, I wish I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> to some, it's a greeting. The word peace in Hebrew is Shalom. Nearly all the letters of Paul uh, start with a greeting phrase. Um, it, include, it includes the Greek word irene, irene, meaning peace. He writes, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Shalom can also be a state of well-being. Uh, this is what David was asking his brothers and the men on the, on the battle line there at the Elah Valley. Um, his dad, Jesse, asked him, son, would you go to the battle line and see if they, you know, ask them about their well-being. David goes there and asks them, how is your shalom? How is your shalom? And so let's, um, let's go now to Matthew 10 and look at this first. Matthew 10, we'll start in verse 34. It says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And then he reads in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give the peace to you. And so I want to look at some of the misconceptions of peace on earth. Um, you know, Jesus did come to bring peace on earth. But equating that uh, with the world peace or a lack of interpersonal conflict is not completely accurate. The peace the world brings and the peace that God brings. The peace the world brings us is dependent on circumstances, right? It can come, it can go like the wind. Um, this peace flows in the midst of, of persecution and trouble, disappointments, confusion, anxieties, right? This conflict, it brings uh, between humankind. That's what Jesus says. I have come to uh, give you peace, but not as the world gives. But that peace may come with conflicts between families, right? 
Keep reading here with me in Matthew 10. What does he say in 35? I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and her daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. And from the very beginning, in the fall in the garden, there was enmity between man and woman, and it's continued to today. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. A saved wife will be against her uh, unbelieving husband. A saved sister against a belligerent brother. There are many that are, are cut off from their families because they now believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let me just read to you what happens to a, a Muslim family, a Muslim, when they become Christian. It says, in the, midst, in the most of radical Muslim families, a convert is locked in a room, given three days to return to Islam. If they refuse, they are slaughtered. If they escape, they will be hunted by family for years. If children are involved, when a husband comes to Jesus, they are considered illegitimate because they no longer have a Muslim father. They are either given to another family member or killed. Now, in a, that's extreme measures. In a less religious family, the convert may be taken to a what's called an imam, that's the leader in the mosque, who may lead the family in beating the believer. If the convert is a woman, her family may force her to marry a Muslim cousin to avoid shame. Many have been restrained with ropes, burned with acid or hot oil, subjected to electric shocks. Sometimes families commit converts to mental institutions thinking that leaving Islam is a mental instability, a state of mental illness. Others are forced to leave their home, family, and the community they know. Can you imagine that? I mean, I, this other side of the world for us, but this is, this is real. When we have peace that only Jesus brings us, it will cause conflict. Jesus also tells us that in this life you will have trouble. But he gives us encouragement. He gives us encouragement in the midst of that trouble. He continue in John 14, 27. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus continues to give them encouragement that night. This, this, in, in John, he's in the upper room giving them some last-minute words. It's quite a bit of, of uh, instructions and encouragement, what's to come. And um, he says there in chapter 16, verse 33, he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You may have irene. In the world you will have tribulation, but what? But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. Also, the peace of God means to trust in God. To have peace with God through Jesus Christ means you have trust in God. That trust in Him is submitting to His ways, His commandments. Trusting that His way is better, His way is safer. Although many times we, we think our own way is, right? Um... I want you to think about a time that you felt like your way of doing something uh, was the best way to do it. Like, I've done this before, I've got this, you know, I can handle this. 
or maybe you just kind of become impatient. I want to, to do this right now. I just want to get it over with. And so we don't wait on the Lord. And then what happens? We fail, right? We fail because we don't wait. We're not abiding with Christ. We're not waiting on Him for an answer. We're not praying. We just want to get it done. We become impatient. Look what happened with Abraham and Sarah when they waited. They waited for the fulfillment of the promised child to the Israelites' journey, to the promised land. God's perfect timing always prevailed. It's stories like this that, um, with their trust and promises of God, that bring assurance and peace to our hearts. We must trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. And that's the next thing that peace between God and man brings, is peace for your heart. Peace for your heart. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then in Colossians 3, 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, in one body, one church. We also have peace when we're reconciled to God. Turn with me to um, 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, we're going to look at verse 17. Second Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. It was through Christ that we were reconciled to God. Now, this word reconciliation in, in the Greek means to have an even exchange in an economic sense. In diplomacy, it describes a relationship of harmony that is, uh, that's established by a peace treaty between former enemies. Were we not former aliens' enemies to God in the flesh? Colossians 1.21, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, by the death of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. Also in Romans 5.10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. This is a great message that a song we sang just a bit ago. Hark the herald angels sing. Some really good theology. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. <laughs> what a great message. We are reconciled through Jesus Christ, who Jesus who brings us peace, and eternal peace, that is. Not peace that the world brings, not something that just kind of comes and goes. That's dependent on your attitude, your mood, circumstances. Eternal. And one more verse. I love this one. Isaiah 53, 5. Mm. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our shalom fell upon him... And by his scourging, we are healed. 
Isn't that awesome? He took chastisement for something he didn't do. But for the sins that we did and we continue to do. And instead of getting what we deserve in punishment and not counting our trespasses, right, against us, instead he gives us shalom. He gives us peace. Then there's the final aspect of peace that God offers to mankind. That is, we need to pursue it. We pursue it. It's, it's, uh, it's offered in a, not on a fixed, on a unilateral action on the part of God alone. That peace has to be received. He has provided forgiveness for all people through the once for all death of His Son. Robert Mount's uh, commentator said this, Only when that forgiveness is received and accepted by faith in the compact, completed, and reconciliation takes place. God's part is finished. Our part is a matter of individual decision. We have to accept it. Somebody can give you a gift. I mean, it's rude not to accept it right in front of them, but uh, we have to accept that gift. We also have to keep it. We have to keep the peace. And not like a first responder type, right? But um, keeping his commandments that result in bringing us peace. Psalm 34, 14 says, Seek peace and pursue it. James three eighteen, A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Peace is only kept when we are in our righteousness. And who is righteous? Those who are keeping His commandments. Those who are abiding, that are not practicing sin. Although we're in sin, but we're not practicing it, right? We're keeping it. We're keeping His commandments. What did the multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God say to the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace among those whom, whom, what? He is pleased. The peace is for those whom he is pleased, and he's pleased in those who are righteous, who keep his commandments. We pursue peace. We, we put our faith in God uh, through Jesus Christ. The evangelist D.L. Moody said, A great many people are trying to make peace that has already been done. God has not left it for us to do. All we have to do is to enter into it. Enter into it. Receive it. Have you received Jesus Christ? gift of peace are you abiding in him you can make that decision today to leave that behind all the all the stuff that satan keeps pointing in your face remember when you did this remember when you did that all you have to do is ask forgiveness and he's forgiven you as far as the east is from the rest from the west amen you can do that today just a minute, we're going to have a, a time of invitation, response. You know, I'd, lo- I'd like to pray with you as you come forward today. Leave that behind. Leave the, the sinful life behind. Come forward and uh, uh, choose to live in peace with Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today th- so thankful for how you provide for us your mercy, (laughs) your grace, the peace that you bring us that the world can't, an everlasting peace. And gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that there's someone here this morning that does not know you, your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, that they would step out, receive you today, the best gift they could ever get during Christmas. 
throughout any time, <laughs> but definitely through Christmas. They would step out and choose to receive you today, Father. Thank you for what you did on the cross. We pray this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Sunday, and so we're going to continue having it on 11 a.m., and then uh, came a lot at 4.30. So. Can I say one thing? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank Tony for bringing the organ back to life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but by the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, all the wonderful blessings that you pour out in our lives. And Father, we pray that we would not lose sight of the reason for the season. 